Welcome to uh, the Thursday, Thursday, October the 31st, 2019 session in our series on edge computing. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the U.S. Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford, and we're very happy to be uh, presenting this uh, program that if you're watching on video, uh, you're seeing that we're on the Stanford YouTube channel. <laughs> so previous sessions in this series are already available on YouTube. Uh, check our website, asia.stanford.edu, in order to find them. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to find all of the sessions in this series, which started back on September the 26th. So uh, we are an industry-funded research center at Stanford, and if you're here in person, please plan to stay after the formal session is over, have some refreshments outside with us, with our speakers and me, and uh, you'll see the member companies of the U.S. Asia Technology Management Center there. So uh, for today's session, ah, before I introduce today's session, we do not have a program next week, November 7. Our next program will be on November the 14th when we have a special video conference presentation coming in live and interactive from Tokyo, Japan, which is where I'll be two weeks from today. Uh, but for today, we're going to talk about TinyML, which is an operating kind of framework to use for edge computing, any kind of artificial intelligence, but it's especially appropriate for edge devices. Uh, with us on my left is Dr. Evgeny Gusev, who is a uh, senior director of engineering for Qualcomm Research. And on my right is Pete uh, Warden, who is a staff research engineer with Google. So we're going to start off with Evgeny. Evgeny uh, is leading the hardware research and development organization in Silicon Valley. He and I have known each other for a number of years because he was sponsoring a lot of research through the Center for Integrated Systems, which then became the System X Alliance at Stanford. And, you know, we've appreciated your work in our programs and your mentoring of our PhD students for a long time. Uh, he's responsible for developing ultra-low-power embedded computing platforms um, and also always-on machine vision AI technologies. He's been with Qualcomm Technologies since 2005 after joining from the IBM T.J. Watson Research Center. Uh, he's held academic professor uh, appointments in Rutgers and also Hiroshima University in 1997. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's also got an MS in applied physics and a PhD in solid state physics. He's edited over 24 books and published 163 papers, and he's an inventor on over 60 issued and filed patents. So I'll introduce Pete when it's Pete's turn to speak. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to ask Evgeny to talk. You've got your slides up, and Pete and I will get to go listen. Okay. We'll see you in a minute. Thanks, thanks. thanks very much for coming. Yeah, thank you, Richard, for the introduction. Is the mic on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. You will sit over so here. Uh, my name is uh, Evgeny Gusev. Again, I'm from Qualcomm Research, uh, um, AI Research. Uh, we are based here in the Bay Area. And uh, today we'll be talking about uh, TinyML. By the way, my background is more on the systems hardware side of things, uh, less so on the software. Pete is the other way. He's uh, more software, less so uh, on the, on the uh, other th type of things. So you can see we are, we are very complementary. We've been partnering on TinyML for quite a while. Uh, when we started this uh, discussion uh, about a year ago, we thought that would be like a topic maybe for a couple dozen of people. Uh, we had our first summit a uh, few months later. It was over uh, 100 people, about 200 people. And now the tiny email community, professional community, is over 1,000 people. You can see it's growing very, very fast. And there are reasons for this. And hopefully, we are going to share this excitement with you today, why we are so excited about this uh, area. Because uh, it's quite interesting for, for three reasons. One, it's uh, uh, very challenging from the technological and science perspective. There is a lot of thinking, a lot of innovations has to go there to make it happen. Second, uh, there are tons of applications there, like enormous applications. We are going to show some examples to you. I, I have some examples. Pete has some examples to share in his presentations. Just tons of examples. It's mind-blowing what you can do with TinyML. And number three, just simply fun to, to do these kind of things and it's kind of uh, be part of this community. 
So this is uh, the four things I'd like to address in my presentation. And this is going to be very, very kind of high level introductory because the idea for today is really to have more Q&A and panel discussion. So this is just to introduce the topic and the, make, make the key points. I'll talk probably for about 10, 15 minutes and then Pete will do the same from his angle and then we'll have a Q&A and panel discussion here. So what I'll try to do in, in the next 10, 15 minutes is really to do four things. One is uh, to define what TinyML is. Uh, second is uh, to tell you why we are so excited about TinyML. Uh, number three is uh, to give you some ideas how to make TinyML type of devices and systems work, what the key ingredients there are, and what are the key uh, applications there, or some of the key applications are. And number three, you're going to see the, the when type of question. So let's start. So we all live in a physical world. We enjoy living in the physical world. And by the way, this is a picture of my dog hiding, hiding, hiding from me. So very, very, very physical, very, very uh, analog world. So at the same time, yet we are living increasingly in a very stressful uh, digital world. So how these two are connected? So when people think about digital world, first thing that comes to mind is cloud, like cloud is everything. But in reality, I think people underestimate the importance of this tiny thing. So this tiny thing is called uh, uh, transducer. So what this thing does, and this thing uh, is composed of the sensor, analog to digital converter, and some kind of microprocessor. So what the thing does, it takes an analog signal from the ambient, and this analog signal can be anything. It can be audio, can be temperature, can be pressure, can be video, can be anything. Pressure, um, chemical signals. And then it converts it into the uh, digital signal, and then the microprocessor does uh, some pre-processing there. And then you have tons of zeros and ones, digital information going to the next, next level. And the next level, typically, it's either edge type of device or cloud type of device. Works fine. You see a lot of applications, see a lot of papers. But this approach has uh, three fundamental or four fundamental problems. Number one, energy. Energy efficiency is very low for this type of systems because we are transferring a lot of data. Because the end goal of the, of the whole exercise here is really to get some meaningful information, meaningful data, not just send the data back and forth. And this type of system today is extremely inefficient because we are sending a lot of data. It takes a lot of bandwidth in the internet and, uh, and so on. Second uh, issue that is becoming more and more critical is privacy because you are sending data over who knows where and uh, you don't know what is going to happen to, to this data. It's, 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 it's a valid concern. Uh, number three, to be able to send this data up and down, it takes time. So you have some latency, and people are increasingly impatient to a few seconds of delay or even milliseconds of delay. It has to be instantaneous. You push a button, and you get your Amazon box like ne ne next minute. So, so, so that's, that's kind of where we are going. So I think latency is important. And number four is reliability. What happens if your network is down? Then you're stuck. So you cannot send the data to the, to the cloud. You're stuck. So that's a problem. And that's what uh, TinyML solves. So basically, what we do with TinyML, and the TinyML, you can see, sits right here. So the way we define TinyML is the technology or set of technologies that enables uh, uh, intelligence happening at the very edge, at the very edge of the physical world, at, at the edge uh, between physical and, and, the, and, and the digital world. And that type of approach solves all these four problems. First, uh, energy, because we do processing right there, so uh, it consumes much less energy. So it's much, much more hundreds of orders of magnitude, more, more efficient than, than the traditional approach. Because uh, all the processing happens at, at, the, at the, this boundary of the physical world, we are not sending data anywhere. So by design, by definition, this is a privacy type of design. So we, we are not facing with any type of issues because whoever produces the data, sensor device or whatever, basically owns this data and just sends metadata out, like uh, the device failed. I see people here, this type of thing. Number three, obviously, because we are not sending data back and forth, there are no latency problems and no reliability problems. That's, that's what TinyML is. But at the same time, to realize this vision uh, in practice, in practical system, it's not so trivial because this type of system are severely constrained from, uh, from uh, all kind of angles. Uh, first of all, uh, this type of devices cannot afford uh, big batteries. At most, you have tens to uh, hundreds uh, milliamps hour type of batteries. Ideally, we would like these devices to run on 
energy scavenging uh, no, with, with no battery and there are some applications, some examples of this. You don't have too much processing power. Um, you have some uh, microcontroller type of processor. They're quite powerful today compared to a few years back, but it's still you're running them at tens, maybe hundreds of uh, uh, megahertz at most uh, without any acceleration. We'll talk about acceleration. You can do some special tricks to make this hardware more efficient, but in general, kind of you, you constrain there. Memory is a big deal because memory is silicon area. You don't really have too much me memory to, to run uh, artificial intelligence at, at the edge, uh, machine learning at, at the edge. And typical machine learning models, they can take today megabytes of memory. So in this type of systems, uh, definitely less than one megabyte and uh, quite often less than 100 kilobytes. So you really, software people are really constrained what you can do because software takes some memory, then you need applications, model, your networks. So that's not challenging. And obviously, if you're talking this massive deployment of, of this type of devices at the edge of the physical and uh, uh, digital world, the cost has to be low. So those are, those are the constraints we have to operate within the, these boundary conditions. So based on this, there is no like, hard definition what tiny ML is. But the way we kind of divide, define it broadly, it's a set of uh, machine learning architectures, techniques, tools and approaches that are helping and capable of doing machine learning operations at, at, at the very edge uh, for a variety of sensing modalities. It can be vision, audio, motion, chemical, uh, and so on. But the key here, and we've been debating this, uh, kind of this number in the uh, tiny ML community for a while, what is the boundary between tiny and not tiny? And kind of today we define Tiny ML is uh, this type of system that operate at milliwatt power or below. That's pretty, pretty challenging target because typically if you run machine learning today on service, it's tens or hundreds of watts. Kind of H type of devices may be uh, watt type of, a few watts type of thing, but getting to this sub milliwatt, which is 1,000x less than the current state of the art, that's, that's not, not the trivial task. And obviously for this, uh, the, the boundary between the physical world and, and the, and the uh, digital world, uh, um, the, the battery operated is a big deal. So why we are doing this, uh, the explanation is shown here. So I think we are increasingly believing that um, data is a new oil or new electricity. I think this, this was invented here at Stanford, I think, that, uh, that oil, that data is, is new oil by Andrew Nguyen and his team. But if you look where the data is, uh, cloud, I think uh, it's about 1% of the data is on, is, 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 is on the cloud. And the, people develop a lot of businesses and business models based on just this one percentage of data. At the edge type of devices where people run uh, optimized CNN on optimized SOCs, um, then you have about 4 or 5% of the data. And this data comes mostly from pictures, people doing likes, dislikes type of things, all this getting in, into the systems and people do machine learning on those GPS data. But 95% of the data is in the physical world. So 95% of the oil that we are not really touching today is in the physical world. So what tiny ML allows, tiny ML allows to extract this oil, this, this money from the physical world and do something useful without it. So that's basically the main motivation here. And that's, why, what, what, that's what you see in the physical world. You have a variety of sensing modalities, CMOS cameras, infrared cameras, um, inertia units, uh, motion units, audio, environmental sensors, temperatures, optical, chemical, a variety of sensors that people can use and get some, some meaningful information to do something either for businesses or for the good of, of, of the society. Again, the motivation here for the tiny email, and that's why we are so excited about this, there is just tons of data available there. We just need to develop these tools and techniques to extract this data and, and, and give it back to, to people. Application-wise, as I said earlier, it's really um, mind-blowing type of thing because uh, uh, tiny email can be used basically everywhere. So you see there medical applications, smart cities, industrial IoT, wearables, uh, cameras, uh, drones, any kind of device, appliances, any uh, wearables, any type of device that is constrained with power and form factor, but any type of device that deals with the physical world, again, we define tiny email where you get the information and you do intelligence right there without sending it to, to, to the cloud. So it's basically everywhere. So that, that's the message there. And then you can think, what is the market size of, of tiny email? And in general, kind of market reports for this type of technologies are not reliable. They're just more like 
a guidance. So we worked with this company in the San Diego area, the Silent Intelligence. They've done some research for us. And you can see we're talking about billions of dollars in the next uh, five years, close to maybe 100 billion, just uh, that what tiny ML can bring back uh, to, to businesses. And the key verticals there is ML logistics, smart cities, uh, infrastructure for, for manufacturing, uh, automation, retail, these big, big verticals. But this is not all of them. Again, there are the medical applications, there are wellness type of applications, uh, smart home type of applications. It's really big market. That, that, that's the message here. OK, so moving on to the, to the how question. I think what we learned as a community and as a company to build efficient uh, tiny ML systems, you really need to look at system holistically. And uh, software, hardware, algorithms, everything, everything need, need, needs to be connected. And everything has to be optimized. You cannot kind of have one thing that is uh, uh, open and uh, lousy defined, and then you have other pieces that, that are optimal. So it really has to be holistic, and it has to be optimal. And uh, this one is just to show that my statement, my claim here is that tiny ML is good enough now. So if you look at the hardware piece, so we see a lot of uh, new hardware accelerators coming there to improve this performance of standard uh, CPUs. There are several companies, big companies, startup companies working on, uh, in, in, in this area. And there is quite a bit of progress there, again, to the point that this type of technologies are uh, more than good enough now. On the algorithm side, and Pete is going to talk about this, uh, again, typical cloud-based ML models take tens, hundreds of megabytes because they have huge Big, big networks, very efficient in terms of accuracy. Uh, but again, they take a lot of, lot of memory, a lot, lot of weights, a lot of layers. So I, I think the challenge here, and there is also quite a bit of progress, how do you make these networks smaller and still working, working very, very well? That's, again, the tiny email challenge. And again, Pete is going to talk about this, and I'll show some examples. And on the software and application side, we already see some applications coming and, and happening in this space, too. That, that's today. Again, tiny email is good enough. What do we see coming in the near future? We see a lot of progress happening in this area. So on the hardware side, there are a lot of uh, uh, good uh, work and research happening both on, on the academic side and the industry side. In some areas shown there, like compute and memory, analog compute, neuromorphic computing, and so on. So this is how do we extend current digital architectures to the next level. That, that will be the next wave on, on the hardware side. On the algorithm side, um, I do believe, and we already see some examples, that these hundreds uh, kilobytes of memory uh, models will become tens or maybe even less. In fact, what we do in Qualcomm, our models today, for some applications, less than 10 kilobytes of memory for vision, audio applications, e e even less. So that kind of becomes, but to do it, it's not, it's not a trivial task. People will be developing new networks, new algorithms. And I have no doubt that in the next three, five years, we are going to see tons of applications that will be blooming uh, using uh, tiny email for all kinds of things. I think doing like we have people here from, from Europe who use machine learning for industrial IoT, doing some uh, pre 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 predictive maintenance for the motors, for example. So well, this is just an example. And I'll show, show more examples in, in a minute. Uh, so first example I'm going to share with you. Uh, and by the way, also, um, we see more, more, more technologies coming, what are called the kind of peripheral technologies. That's ultra-low power sensors, new memories, 3D stacking. How do you put things together? Energy scavenging, extremely low power radios. I mean, this will all help to make this uh, field uh, developing faster and, and bigger and growing it bigger. Moving on to examples, how examples. First one, this is uh, uh, my baby or my team's baby. Uh, we develop extremely low power uh, vision sensor. So typically, the way you do computer vision today, and some people in the audience know this, uh, you take an image, uh, take, use a camera to take an image, uh, high resolution image, uh, 720, 1080, or even high resolution image, and then you transmit this image to the edge device or to the cloud device, and you do processing there. So the sensor takes power, transmission takes power, processing takes power, and that becomes kind of a big, again, hundreds of milliwatts type of uh, uh, power consumption. So what we do in this case, again, we look at the whole system holistically. We design the architecture shown there on, on the right. So this is a dedicated processor that has some dedicated hardware block to accelerate um, machine learning computer vision there. 
Uh, we have lo extremely low power dedicated ASIC, uh, low power CPU, we have low power memory. Uh, we have also a power management unit there, which is not shown. Uh, this allows us to do innovations there at the processor level. We have special design for the sensor. This sensor consumes as much power as accelerometer and gyro in Nippon today. So it's, it's kind of insane that the whole thing is less power than what accelerometers and gyros use, which is kind of invisible on, on the phone. And uh, as a result, we, if we have like less than one milliwatt, kind of again qualified to be tiny ML uh, power, um, uh, for the whole end-to-end -end system. It, it's extremely low. Again, the output of this device, we're not sending images, so the output of this device is, is metadata. I can show you an example here. So the whole, the whole device, by the way, is shown here. It's like about a few millimeters by few millimeters. I have it here in my pocket, so it's like, like about this grain of rice type of size, type of device. Uh, and the functionality, for example, one of them in terms of privacy. So this one runs a face detection model. You see this, the blue light here detects my face when I look at this thing. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so now it's, uh, I'm looking at the thing for face, face detection. The mirror is just to see where the face is. But the, the point here, we're running uh, computer vision algorithms in this uh, battery operated device at high frame rates, less than one milliwatt of power. We're not sending images to the data. All uh, detection, all classification, everything happens in this uh, in this uh, very tiny device, two by two. And I'll, I'll show some some kind of examples where it can be used. So it can be used in many different applications. You can do those are real real images from this device, which we don't transmit. This is just for demonstration purposes. Uh, human detection. Uh, then we do face detection. You can train models just like standard um, uh, machine learning type of techniques to do logo detection. You can do some detection for retail, like uh, shelf status, uh, customer engagement, how much time customers spend in front of the shelf in supermarkets. Uh, you can build a lot of use cases on this. You can do a gesture type of detection. All of this extremely low power. Yes, everything happens in this small form factor. The question was, do we run the machine learning at this, uh, at this small device? Yes, everything ha happens there. The output is just metadata, which is the digested uh, uh, result there. So this is to show how uh, we use tiny ML. Instead of, remember the picture I showed at the beginning, you have the physical world, analog world, and we bring all of this to the edge, uh, and we do all this analytics at the edge. So next, yeah? Uh, to clarify, is TinyML a set of technology standards or a language or how, at this point, uh, it? Well, at this point, it? it's a language. It's a term. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And as I said earlier, it's a term which we are still defining accurately. Standards okay. will come probably in some time soon. Okay. But there are no standards at this point. Just so like, like IoT, there are no standards in there. It's yeah. a common approach, right. but is it owned by anybody? It's mm. not owned by Qualcomm, right? No, it's not by Qualcomm. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a group of people who it's are a, agreeing right. to do things in the same right. way. Right. At this point, it's a community of people, okay. an ecosystem of people yeah. who would like to develop these technologies together. People doing sensors, people doing processors, people doing software, people doing algorithms, people doing applications all coming together and building this tiny ML community. So it's a relatively <laughs> open set of information right. that you can get about how to do this. Right. It's not relative, it's, it's very open. This is critical point. It's, though, it's right? by design because yeah. uh, we believe that the tiny ML pie is going to be so big there will be yeah. enough uh, slices for everyone who contributes to, to, make, to make it happen. There are no, okay. no, no, no silos there. Okay. Just again, it's an open community for, of people who want to collaborate, partner, and yeah. accelerate this community globally. Okay. In all, across different industries, across different technologies. It's, okay. But the key there, as I showed earlier, is really this boundary between the physical world and, and the, yeah. uh, and because we are not doing routers, uh, this type of thing. It's really, and Pete will also show, show some examples. It's how do we do machine learning and machine intelligence at the, at the sensor level, at the, at the physical world level? Sure. But I, I guess the reason that I'm asking this question is because way back in like 3G, you know, Qualcomm was a key developer of CDMA technologies. And that was something that led to lots of licensing for Qualcomm. 
but tiny ML is a different kind of thing. It's a different thing in a way that we have silicon providers like us providing yeah. solutions to okay. to people that are software developers, like what Peter's going to be talking about, developing yeah. solutions for this. And these solutions are all open source. You can go to the GitHubs and and get the codes codes to be able there. And then I think differentiation comes mostly from the end users, people who use this to solve real problems. So, so, so the okay. tiny ML is a tool box of all these things to solve the, the big problems. Yeah. And, okay. I, and I, I think if you wanted to use an analogy with CDMA, I think we're still at the stage where we're trying to persuade everyone that people would like to have cell phones rather than <laughs> competing on like the best way to do it. So okay. it's, we're in okay. that like, evangelical mode of... Right, right. That, that's a very good point. We are in the very early stage. I think the standards and everything will come later. Okay. Uh, as the things so will. we'll come back when we're all three yeah. talking as a panel. We'll come back <laughs> yeah. into this. Yeah. But I you know, wanted to kind of get that off. Yeah. Okay. So I, I would like to switch gears because I think Pete needs to yeah. present his stuff too uh, soon. Switch gears to, to the next modality, which is audio. Obviously, audio is important. I mean, vision is about 87% uh, of human perception. Uh, audio is about 10%. Uh, so tiny email is really also good for all on voice. Uh, here I'm showing two companies, obviously, with their permission. Uh, both of them are startups, uh, both of them in the, in, the, in the Southern California area. Uh, Sentient, what they do, they use uh, very small neural nets, about four layers, and they develop very efficient ASIC. I mean, this is the ASIC they use, uh, about two millimeters square or something. And what this allows them to do, this allows them to do 64 classes of keyword detection at extremely low power of, uh, in this generation, this is the first generation of silicon, 140 microwatts. So that, that, that's kind of quite impressive what you can do it. And the approach they, they've chosen is to use this short, small networks, and it actually work, works quite fine with their, uh, their own uh, training tools. So the other approach is from, uh, from another startup, Aeon Devices. So they uh, kind of look at this also holistically. They do uh, audio processing at all levels, the data preparation training, and then they do uh, RTL design. This is a design company uh, for their own chip, and you can see their power consumption is about 100 microwatts, about the same range uh, than, than the previous one. And they estimate, I showed the market numbers earlier, that in a couple of years, in a few years, it's going to be about 8 billion devices deploying uh, this, this type of technology. So again, audio is important, and tiny email is a really good application for this one. Moving on to the next modality is uh, uh, talking about sensors. Uh, everyone knows Bosch. Bosch is the number one uh, sensor company in the world today. Uh, so they're shipping uh, billions of sensors to, to their consumers. So this is the presentation uh, from their CEO uh, last week, also with their permission, obviously. Uh, so they've been talking about what, what's been happening with sensors the, from the software perspective. So the first wave was just to, to be able to use software for sensors. The second wave was to do more fusion. And now they're talking about the third wave. And the third wave they identify from the sensor side now is HAI and sensor boards. And what they're emphasizing here is that uh, software is becoming increasingly intelligent, enabling AI inside the sensor itself again. They're talking about tiny ML coming not only from the software side, from the processor side, but also from the sensor side. So, and having companies like, like Bosch with this massive shipment will again uh, help to deploy this tiny email at, at massive scale uh, at this level as well. And they show a couple of interesting examples. One example is use temperature, pressure, humidity. And uh, by the way, this device, the diaper, is probably as analog as it gets. So, and <laughs> and, and uh, what they're interested in is the state of this uh, device. Is it dry, wet, dirty? So again, you can use uh, some tiny ML there to be able to do this kind of things. Uh, another example is a little bit more sophisticated if you get more sensor data, like temperature, uh, gas quality, uh, vision for human presence. You can use this type of device to model uh, forest climate models, to do some uh, risk management for, for fires and, and other type of applications like early fire detection and so on. But again, the point, I'm, uh, two points I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to make here. One is, again, you can use tiny email for all kind of different sensor modalities. And, and second, having this type of huge momentum from the sensor company is, is, is really going to accelerate tiny email coming, coming to the market in the next uh, few years. 
And the last example I'm going to use is uh, uh, from this company. It's also a startup. Uh, this is a, a spin off from Intel. And uh, since email, they showed a tiny email meetup this, uh, this Monday. You have uh, monthly meetups if you're interested. I'll, I'll show you some information. So what they do, they develop software tools to be able to train models uh, to use uh, accelerometers and gyros. You see accelerometers and gyros, uh, IMU units attached to the, to the motor or any kind of IoT device. And then you can train models to find some abnormalities. And you can use these abnormalities to whatever you want to do there. So, so again, tiny ML type of applications, because in this case, uh, uh, in the past, people used massive inertia type of units. They cost thousands of dollars. And now, thanks to MEMS, these type of devices cost a couple of dollars and uh, low power. And then you can use these devices in big volumes. Again, I, 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 we're probably not going to have time to show all tiny ML examples, but I just wanted to give you a flavor how you can use tiny ML for vision, for audio, for chemical sensing, for IMU sensing, and, and tons of applications. And Pete is going to, to, to share more. To sum up, uh, I started with three questions. Uh, the first question is, what is tiny ML? Again, tiny ML is machine learning technologies and approaches at, at the very edge between the physical world, uh, analog world, and, and the physical and, and, and the digital world. And it has to be done at a milliwatt or less type of power. That's how we define it. Why? Because there are a lot of uh, analytical capabilities and data capabilities at this level and a lot of financial opportunities there. Uh, how you need to design your systems holistically, uh, system software uh, and hardware co-design. And when, I think hopefully I show you that this, this type of technologies are ha happening now. A couple of announcements before I turn, we turn to Sweet. I think uh, Pete and I and a group of us, uh, we are organizing our second annual summit. It's going to be here in the Bay Area. I think there are still a few spots available, but not too many. So if, if you're interested, please go to the website, and you can get all this information there. So those are the companies who signed up to support it this year. You see very, very impressive list of um, the so these companies are sponsoring the conference, yes. or they're sponsoring the whole tiny ML movement. How do I look at uh, this? At this point, formally speaking, it's the the conference. Okay. Informally speaking, they are members of yeah, the okay. of, of, of this okay. movement community. And uh, talking about companies, those are the companies who attended the the first uh, summit. Uh, in, uh, in March, it was about 90 companies. Again, you see all these names. This is participants. So you see very, very diverse community, people from, from, from the whole spectrum, basically, from like applied material, which is tool guys, all the way to so so software companies and uh, big, small companies. Stanford was there, too. So we, ha we have Boris on, on, on the committee, as, as you know. And as I say, the community is growing rapidly. Uh, so we are over 1,000 people now. Uh, it's, again, open, open community. And uh, online, we have two tools. We're doing meetups uh, in, in, in the Bay area here monthly, typically about 100 plus people. And then uh, our tiny email in Lincoln community is about 600 people. So if you're interested, join us. And there are a lot of discussions around, around tiny email. And that's it, I guess. That's kind of, that came from one of the engineers <laughs> at Google. <laughs> OK, thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Great. So let me kind of change the slides over to uh, Pete's slides. Yes. And while we're doing that, how do I get out of this? Thank you. In show? Yeah. That makes sense. And then start this yes. show. Um, so Evgeny, if somebody wants to join the tiny ML movement, yeah. what do they do? Just join. How? <laughs> Who do they talk to? You? Uh, yeah. I mean, okay. we have a, uh, we'll, we can talk about this later. We have a non-profit organization okay. uh, that was formerly entity. It's yeah. called Tiny ML Foundation. And there are people who, who manage this. Uh, the contact is a bit, uh, it's on the website. I mean, okay. the easiest is to remember is to go to the website, tinymlsummit.org, and, and there are people who help in this thing. And it's Thursday meetup, right? Sorry? What? Thursday meetups in the Bay Area. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There are meetups. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Now this is a great start. 
Why don't you pick it up, Pete? Pete Warden is a research engineer at Google. Uh, he's the technical lead of the TensorFlow mobile and embedded team. And before joining Google, he was with Jetpack uh, from 2011 until it was acquired, I guess, by Google yeah. in 2014. <laughs> and Jetpack actually analyzed photo data from Instagram to create in-depth guides to more than 5,000 cities yes. worldwide. Uh, and before that, he has experience as a serial entrepreneur. He was also with uh, Apple for a while as a senior engineer. So, uh, great. Pete, Pete Warden, thanks very much for coming and talking with us and giving us some use cases for TinyML. No, thank you. And thank you, Evgeny. Um, so, uh, the question we had was, oh, how do you actually get involved in TinyML? Well, I'm going to be talking about an open source framework that you can just download. Um, and you can actually just buy an Arduino for about 30 bucks and then just use the Arduino IDE to start running all of the examples that I'm going to be showing you. Um, so I wanted to kind of get into the sort of the concrete um, way that you can actually start playing with and using and building products around TinyML right now. Um, so just to kind of recap, what we're aiming at are these devices that have incredibly small amounts of memory. Um, you know, we're down to like the tens of kilobytes of RAM and flash. So we have all of these like kind of constraints we have to deal with when we're writing software for these. Um, the good news though is there's over 250 billion of these out there in the world already. There's 40 billion being sold every year. And that number is going by 20% every year as well. Um, and their average price hovers around 50 cents. Um, and you can even get some that are down to as low as three cents each. So you can buy microcontrollers that are pre pretty much cheaper than like, you know, a resistor or a capacitor, <laughs> which is, um, you know, kind of mind-blowing. Um, and I was being asked as well, like, okay, where are these? We don't see them. Um, so where do these exist? You have probably tens or even maybe hundreds of these in your car. They're in your washing machine. They're in your toaster. They're in the toys your kids have. They're in every medical device. Um, they're in your credit cards. Um, almost anything that is manufactured um, and has any kind of electrical component is going to have a microcontroller in it now because they're way cheaper than even just kind of like the old way of wiring sort of wires together to make things happen. It's way easier to just use software um, to uh, build your systems now. Um, so what TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers actually does is it takes TensorFlow, this very um, you know, powerful system for training uh, machine learning models. And it figures out how to help you get those kinds of models down into this like tens of kilobytes environment. Um, so we already had TensorFlow Lite for, my, uh, for mobile devices. And that was giving you, you know, you could fit your code into maybe hundreds of kilobytes. But in order to actually fit this into the kind of environments that we needed to run in with embedded systems, we had to create our own interpreter and do a whole bunch of um, stuff around uh, the software engineering to avoid things like even relying on there being any kind of operating system. You can't allocate memory. Um, you can't expect that there's going to be any kind of printf or any way of, you know, sort of, you know, dealing with strings or even any of the basic standard C library stuff. Um, so we had, um, you know, it's a bit like kind of building a cathedral out of matchsticks. We had to kind of figure out how to do all of the machine learning stuff we needed to do without any of the tools that we were used to having so that we could actually shrink things down into like a 20 kilobyte footprint. Um, as I mentioned, the good news is that you can actually grab this right now. You can get a board for just sort of you know, $15, $30, um, and actually start running all of the examples that I'm going to be showing you. 
Um, and you can get these boards from a whole variety of different um, you know, providers. Because it's an open source project, you don't have to be tied to any particular sort of hardware. You can actually um, you know, run this code with most of the major embedded systems. So I've been talking a lot about you know, machine learning in the abstract, but what does this mean in practice? What can you actually um, do right now? Um, I actually had a magic wand that I was going to show you um, that I thought was very appropriate for Halloween, <laughs> but unfortunately I left it at my desk, so you'll just have to imagine it. <laughs> um, but that was actually a great example of using gesture recognition using an accelerometer. Um, and you can actually download that example right now um, from uh, as part of the TensorFlow um, Arduino uh, library and also the library for all of these other boards that we're talking about. Um, you can also do simple speech recognition. Uh, I was actually first attracted to this whole world when I, for, when I joined Google back in 2014. Um, and I was talking to the speech team, and I found that they had a 14 kilobyte model, neural network model, that they were using to recognize OK Google on people's phones. Um, so that was really kind of the inspiration for me uh, to start looking into this was, wow, if you can do so much with um, such a small model for speech, what else can we do with this? Um, so we do have a speech recognition example that you can train yourself. Um, we also have an open source example of doing person detection, kind of like what Evgeny was showing, um, where it's actually possible to have uh, a device wake up when there's somebody around, which is one of the most common use cases that we actually get asked for. Um, and as Evgeny was saying as well, predictive maintenance is a really important um, area. Um, we all know we can hear when our car is starting to have a problem, um, it turns out that neural networks can be trained to kind of spot those kind of anomalies too and can be really, really useful. Um, surprisingly to me, I discovered that it's actually really hard to plug something in in a factory. Um, having sensors that are peel and stick to do this kind of predictive maintenance is really, really important. Um, even though theoretically you might have power, it can cost thousands of dollars and be extremely disruptive trying to access power. So having something that's able to run on a battery and just kind of be stuck on the side of a machine to tell when it's about to go wrong um, turns out to be incredibly useful. Um, talking about uh, speech recognition, I kind of wanted to give you some um, you know, rough rules of thumb for how much work is involved in running these models. So we have our example speech detection model. It's got about 20,000 parameters in it, and they're stored as 8-bit. So that works out to be about a 20 kilobyte model. Um, and it requires about 7 million arithmetic ops per second. So if you think about a microcontroller that might be running at you know, 50 megahertz or something like that, um, as long as you can do an arithmetic op in like two or three cycles, you've got room to spare uh, to actually run this model, even on a comparatively kind of low horsepower chip. Um, person detection, on the other hand, uh, is a bit beefier. Uh, it requires 250 kilobytes of space. So you know this is over 200,000 parameters. Um, and it needs around 60 million arithmetic ops. So this is going to take either a processor that has a bit more oomph, if you want to do it in kind of under a second, or it's going to take a couple of seconds to do each inference. Um, but you know, there's lots of applications where being able to sort of you know, detect a person every couple of seconds isn't actually a severe constraint. Um, the gesture uh, recognition. Uh, example is, again, about a 20 kilobyte model. I don't have the exact number of arithmetic ops, but it's about the same as the sort of the voice recognition stuff. Um, so 
hopefully that's given you some like concrete examples to think about this stuff. And you know, if you grab the code and download it, you can actually dig through it and play with it yourself and really kind of get a feel for how well this stuff works. So where are we going after this? I mean, Evgeny has talked about a lot of this already, but in some of the um, you know, concrete uh, ways forward, I think we're going to see voice interfaces in almost anything that um, people want to interact with. You know, once you have the possibility of being able to do a good voice interface for 50 cents, and it will run for a year on a coin battery, um, you're going to end up having voice interfaces replacing switches and buttons in almost any consumer item. And especially if you think about um, devices being able to combine audio and video. So voice interfaces that know when you're looking at the object. So if you have 20 devices around your house, uh, you don't have to have a special keyword for each one. Um, so that's my guess for where the biggest immediate growth is going to be is like this stuff is starting to become possible now. Um, and we've already seen that voice interfaces are actually pretty popular with people. Um, so if we can get them in more places, um, we're just waiting really on the, you know, the hardware um, to be available uh, for this to happen. Um, longer term, there's going to be a massive amount of adoption of ML for all of these cases where the physical world needs to interact with the digital world. Um, so almost any embedded systems uh, worldwide, these hundreds of billions of devices, which I think are going to grow into trillions of devices, are all going to be um, using these. And kind of like where these questions were coming about like what is TinyML, um, we're in this stage where we're trying to bring together people from all of these different communities. You know, I hadn't had any experience doing embedded development before I dived into this a few years ago. So I've had to kind of get myself up to speed on uh, what uh, embedded developers already know. But most embedded developers don't know any machine learning. So both communities are having to kind of join together. And then there's a whole hardware community as well. <laughs> Who, uh, you know, so <clears throat> really what we look at is the way that machine learning as a field has grown by being very, very open um, and by sharing models and by having open source frameworks right from the start. Um, and we're hoping that we can follow the same kind of model for the TinyML uh, community where all of these people who have the different art pieces of the puzzle are able to come together and actually talk openly and actually help um, you know, drive this field forward and help kind of achieve the promise that we, I think, all see um, in here. So I'm hoping that uh, you know, some of you may actually be interested in this and will get involved and have ideas and have problems that can be solved. Um, and I'll be looking forward to uh, the discussion and talking to you afterwards. That's great. Thank you, Pete. So, Pete, why don't you and Evgeny sit closer to the middle and let me stay over on the uh. side? I think you're the center of the program today. I, I was trying to hide. Watch your, <laughs> you watch your mic. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, as a technical kind of initiative, I think this is great, but what do you have to tell the business people to make this work? To, if you've got somebody who says, okay, I'm developing something at X company, and we must own everything, we must keep it all quiet, stay away. I mean, I would say, sure, that's fine. I mean, you're welcome to take <laughs> Go up. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're, it's open source software. We, we're super happy okay. to have people take it and, and build things. Um, you know, we think that you'll get more out of it if you're involved in the community. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll, I, you know, I'm quite happy to be in kind of uh, transmit only mode. <laughs> okay. And you know, what we really are looking for is anything that can help people build these things, I think is, yeah. is going to have a big positive impact. So even if 
people aren't able to contribute back by discussions, if they're actually able to build cool stuff using this, we're happy. So an open source software community. And uh, in that regard, you're running into all this kind of problems these days where you know, people are trying to say you've got export control because this is, uh, you know, has military applications. How do you deal with those international problems? I noticed that the list of companies that Evgeny had listed up there has people, has companies from just about everywhere. The participants are involved, you know, I saw Huawei up there, I saw NXP from Europe up there, I NST from Europe up there, I saw a bunch of American companies up there. How do you do this? Well, I think we're dealing with technology, <clears throat> and technology has a longer, uh, mm -hmm. uh, longer term ro runway compared to okay. the politics, because politics change okay. ba back and forth. I think we are developing the platform that people can, can use okay. uh, globally. That's okay. No, this is great, but this is really important to think that this can be done in this kind of a, you know, situation where you've got uh, countries that are kind of maybe decoupling from each other. Yeah. It applies to all technologies. It's not just tiny amount, right? They yeah, right, right. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. And I think to your earlier questions on the, on the business uh, of tiny email, I mean, the way I think about this is that tiny email is a tool that we offer to the, to the different um, verticals for people to, sell, to solve problems. So, mm -hmm. And as a tool, tool makers make money. Like software people will be making money, hardware people will be making money, algorithm uh, people who train uh, these things. But on top of this, uh, people who solve problems will be ma making money too. And hopefully this money will also go back to, to this community through different business models, like revenue sharing type of models and so on. I mean, the key there is really to create this value and how the value is going to be shared. I think it will be shared one way or the other. Yeah. It may be disproportional, um, but uh, that's, that's the nature of business. But uh, definitely everyone who has leading edge technologies are going to, con going to benefit from this. Okay, so let's open the floor to questions. Go ahead, I saw your hand first. So <laughs> I, I saw your uh, slide about, this is a question for Pete. Uh, yeah. slide, slide about seven million ops for the audio inference and something like 100 million for the 60 video. million, 60 I think. million, yeah. okay. Um, is, the, is the TensorFlow Lite giving you these numbers or do you calculate them some other way? Um, so there are ways to, um, yeah, I was actually able to get these through TensorFlow Lite, but it's also possible to just um, do pen and paper calculations is for that, most of these models. Um, I think I used one of our internal scripts, actually. Um, but I've also, for other ones in the past, I've just, you know, especially small models, you know, if there are only a tens of thousands of parameters, you can usually just kind of write on the back of an envelope and... Okay, and um, when you're writing these for a specific target, like let's say an Arduino, um, does the platform tell you what the limit is for that specific hardware, or...? It tells you what the limits are for memory. For the number of calculations, it basically means you're gonna have to wait longer for the result. Like the late, it just impacts oh, it the just latency. Pipe the yeah, so it'll still be able to run. It just might take like six seconds to produce a result rather than two seconds or whatever the, you know, uh, depending on the speed of the processor. So the interpreter handles all that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, do you have any projects you're thinking about? Yes. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, specifically for audio, but yeah, there's a bunch of other ideas. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, the techniques you're doing, you've defined a milliwatt as sort of an operating point. The ones that you're using to get down to 20k parameters, maybe 250k parameters, why don't one watt systems then fit in that same approach? Well, what you're trading off is accuracy. So for most um, like one watt systems, they don't, you know, usually they're either plugged in or plugged in every night. So shaving off a, you know, a bit of energy usage for a drop in accuracy is often not the right trade off for them. Um, we do, you know, use those same techniques to help people, for example, ship 
mobile apps that are smaller, because <laughs> that's a big deal. Like you've got like hundred megabyte limits on some app stores and things, so people can't afford to have like twenty megabytes. They can only have like five hundred k or something. So we do use the same techniques, but the the constraints and the trade offs are, are different in the different spaces. So the accuracy being the yeah, exactly. It's, it's like what we tend to do is like you, you. We being who? Um, we being, I think, the broader ML community, but also just when we're talking about specifically when we're creating examples and sample code and mm -hmm. kind of demos. Um, what we'll usually try and do is get a model that's as accurate as possible and don't, you know, damn the size. <laughs> And then once you've got to that point, you can then use a bunch of techniques to do trade-offs to kind of make it smaller but drop the accuracy a bit and like, oh, make it a bit faster but drop the accuracy a little bit more. But hopefully you're still above the, like kind of the operating point of the accuracy you need. So it's like this race to kind of get as much accuracy as you can and then you can kind of sell some of the accuracy for other properties that you want to want to hit for your engineering. Okay, this is great for technical work that people can agree to cooperate on and, uh, you know, <laughs> in terms of somebody who's trying to develop a system, um, if they're in a big company or if they're in a startup company, so yes, we should use TinyML. They say that back to the company. What does the company say? Oh, I think it's all. We want to own it. Yeah, no, I think right? it's all application specific. And yeah. I think there is quite a bit of know how and IP that is being generated when you apply knowledge mm -hmm. like TensorFlow, yeah. Light, or TensorFlow Micro mm -hmm. to, solve, yeah. to solve a specific problem. That, that's kind of where you have quite a bit of uh, IP and, generated. And, okay. I, and I think the key thing is that if you're the company, what you are really supposed to be good at is knowing what your customers need. And so you're going to be able to build a better model than anybody else because you know what the requirements are better than anybody else, and you can serve the customers better than anybody else. Okay. And, and how, do you, how do you keep there from being so many different flavors of tiny ML that it kind of loses its cohesiveness? Well, I think ideally you'd like to be on a platform, like, like one platform, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, TensorFlow, and you have uh, hardware devices like ARM type of devices, startup mm -hmm. of devices, uh, RIGS-5 type of <laughs> devices, using this as a framework to run tiny mail on this type of devices. Yeah, okay, uh, are you looking at any kind of a model in the past as having been a really particularly good model for the development community kind of follow, like Unix <laughs> or um, you know, some of the, the wireless technology? You know, I, I mentioned CDMA earlier, but I'm coming at this from the outside, from a non-technical aspect, right? And so I think it's really important for the business community to understand how the technology community can make this happen. Well, I would, I would think about Android yeah. as an example. Okay. You know, that's an open okay. source technology okay. that enables a lot of different companies to produce you know, their yeah. own products. Like it's this enabling technology that... Yeah. Um, yeah. And really, I think that that's something that Google really helped to deliver. And Google saw that the bigger openness of Android was a benefit to Google without taking over what other people were trying yeah. to hold as their own proprietary work. OK, OK. Uh, my question is, in these devices, while you're still doing all the, uh, the ML, um, which communication technologies can you also accomplish? I think uh, that again very specific on the application. Uh, like for example, what we do for some customers and for some some of them uh, Bluetooth type of technologies, some of them Wi-Fi type of technologies, some of them use uh, cellular LTE type of technologies. Five G in the future. I think five G is going to have a lot of promise for for, for this type of but, connected devices. But it's your expectation that that will be accommodated yeah. along with all these algorithms for ML. I think initially it's probably going to be more like a standalone technologies when you put them together in the system. Eventually there may be some co-optimization happening at the connectivity level as well. And this is simply because these tiny ML machine uh, systems are becoming so efficient, so you can get your inference done 
at very low energy. So by the next question is, even like these few bits of in information, how do you transmit it? The transmit takes more energy than the inference, because this, the tiny email is actually getting very, very good. And then people are doing some smart things. You do batching, you send your data once a day for some applications instead of doing it every second. But I think it will be some innovations, and we, we see some startups in this space too, in the, the low-power radio type of technologies as well. And, and one way to think about it is you can almost see ML as this really good data compression technique where instead of sending like raw video streams from some like camera that's looking at the subway tracks and then trying to make sense of them on the other end like you just have something that um, say, like only ever transmits when there's a person on the subway tracks and that suddenly Which turns... Which means that instead of sending gigabytes or terabytes yes, of data, <laughs> you're sending... You're you know. sending one bit, effectively, yeah. like maybe once every few months. Cascading and the other right. Ex exactly, yeah. But my question is specifically about the communication technology. What can you accommodate along with you in, the, in the kilobytes and the milliwatt uh, well, what's restriction? Depends on the range, depends on the duty cycle. But there are some technologies in this uh, milliwatt type of range. And so, uh, and, and really the way I think about it is duty cycling. Like if we can make it so that even if it takes like 500 milliwatts for like 10 seconds to send something, if you only have to do that once a month rather than like continuously, then. Yeah. Okay. What does the patent minefield look like for tiny ML? Have any trolls appeared yet? Presumably <laughs> Qualcomm and Google have large patent portfolios. <laughs> I mean, the short answer, we have not looked into this. Uh, we know that many companies are active in this field. I assume startups and big companies, they're fighting. But I think another thing is also there are many techniques that are sort of like there is a cross-pollination happening between the tiny ML world and the big ML world. Like some of the techniques like compression, quantization, those things, they came from the edge type of devices. I think we use the tiny ML too. But there is also some fundamental IP, as I said earlier, because we are very constrained what we can do in the tiny ML. So that means the challenge always means an opportunity, and whoever solves this challenge gets gets a solution, and it can be patentable. So there are some 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 uh, tiny email specific IP as well, so, but Thanks. we don't see any kind of patent wars you know, on the horizon yet. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm coming from it from a non-technical standpoint, but you said that tiny email reduces the privacy concerns that you have with edge or cloud. I was wondering if you could walk us through that. Presumably all the analytics is being done on device, but who owns that data and how does it mitigate privacy concerns? And the second question is, um, in China we've seen an increasing sort of bifurcation of open source. So Huawei has now Humong and um, you have Baidu with the Apollo open source. You, what's the tiny ML community like overseas, particularly in Asia? And is there a risk of you know of increasing decoupling in open source platforms? Yeah, I think on, on, on the first question, as I said, it's by design intrinsically tiny ML type of devices are privacy. I can give you a couple of examples. Like, for example, the cameras I show there, you can put this type of devices in the bedroom, bathroom, uh, elderly, elderly uh, care facility, because all it does is says, I see people in, a, or let's say, hotel room. If there is a fire in the hotel, it would know that this room has two occupants. And, the rest of the hotel is empty, so then the, the firefighters will go to this room. But we are not sending data, it's just like it, it, it sends metadata there. So I think the metadata is really the key for the privacy, um, and again, it's by design. And on the second question, uh, the tiny ML community in China, there are, there are players there. I think it's probably not as communities here. In fact, we've been thinking about doing a tiny ML also, so sort of like um, summit uh, there as well. It's probably going to happen ne next year. But obviously there are, as you say, it's very China-specific um, aspects there as well, how, how you do these things there. Um, and the key thing for me for privacy is that even though you have like a camera sensor, the data never leaves the device, um, like the recording, the image data, the audio data never leaves the device and actually gets kind of thrown away after each frame. So there, that really mitigates the risk of like you're not sending it anywhere. It's staying local. Um, and one of the things that I've actually been proposing and that we've been talking about in the, uh, some of the TinyML sort of community meetings is can we come up with a standard that actually enforces 
that inability to record data at the hardware level. So we can actually make sure that all you get out is the output of running a model on that data. So like uh, Evgeny said, the metadata, like, yes, there's a person here. No, there isn't a person here. Um, and that even if there's a malicious person who's trying to kind of you know, subvert some of these devices, they actually can't get through to the hardware that's actually got the raw input signal. Because, uh, yeah, I think this is, a, you know, this is one of the th reasons I'm excited about this, and I think this is really important, this area, is it gives us this chance to have much more control over what's happening with data. Um, and you know, I've, I've on the second question, you know, I've been over to um, Beijing. There's been a fantastic, um, you know, kind of response to when we did a um, uh, open community meeting around TensorFlow Lite and microcontrollers. Um, there's a lot of um, you know companies out there doing fantastic stuff. Um, so you know, I see um, a very bright future for this sort of tiny ML stuff in Asia in general um, and you know, China in particular. So how do you see the tiny ML kind of community developing? Will it be essentially a technical community that is then certifying something as being compliant with tiny ML or using tiny ML as, a, as sort of the, the tools of techniques of tiny ML, but yet you know, I can see how. Um, you know, how 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 do you, how how do you how do you ensure that people aren't taking data that would people would not want to have taken? So I think there's two questions there. I mean, one of yeah. them is um, at least <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, one of them is like what we see. You know, honestly, I see the tiny ML community at the moment as. Like somebody years ago said, said something to me along the lines of the only way things get ever get done in Silicon Valley is when you've got a conspiracy of engineers. And <laughs> you know, right now it feels like we're in this conspiracy of engineers phase where we're all at these different companies and we want to go to our management and mm -hmm. say, hey, look, here's this cool prototype. Here's this cool thing yeah. that is now possible that was not possible before. Mm -hmm. Let's do something with this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, you know, if we can get to that stage, then that is going to kind of like, you know, that knowledge is going to percolate through the company and it's going to be, you know, through our different companies mm -hmm. and it's going to sort of become a thing. Um, now, in terms of how we ensure that these things aren't misused, I mean, that's where having standards is actually helpful and having something that can be audited to make sure that it is actually secure. Uh, and mm -hmm. the same way that we approach kind of, you know, security in general. If we can come together and have some thing that people can, you know, point to and say, look, this has been checked. We have done everything we can to make sure that this can't be used as a recording device. Mm -hmm. I think that that will be really important. Okay, I good. I think we're, we're at the beginning of a very long journey. Yeah. So I think right, yeah. right now it's deeply technical. It's by design. Again, that's what you want it to be. I mean, the first step is to make sure people speak the same language and understand each other, and then. Be and I think maybe the dynamics of a of a, you know, a very positive technical community that would say, "Look, this is what you're going to give up if you if you do get into this kind of recording or whatever." Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you did mention. You did mention that, you did mention that um, you're using Arduino board. And uh, I know there are so many flavors. I'm trying to, what is your vision on how harder companies can differentiate themselves? Is there going to be a harder acceleration that uh, is going to accelerate this uh, tiny amount? I mean, I think, there's, I think there's all sorts of, I mean, the great news is that there's lots of problems at the moment <laughs> with the whole process. So, you know, you can differentiate on usability, you know, which Arduino is really good at. Um, you could differentiate on what, total what, what system is, power. What is this Arduino? What, what are you talking oh, about? Arduino is the most popular hobbyist and maker microcontroller. Okay. So it's this very open community. I think they have tens of millions of developers who are actually using Arduinos to build all sorts of, 
you know, too. and and within Arduino, also we have a, a, a large plethora uh, of uh, different microcontrollers. Okay, it depends on the core. I'm not sure yeah. if you have it's tuned for a specific microcontroller, but you have the core that's three and four and seven and so forth. Okay, yes. great. So, what is the potential for using uh, the tiny ML? for mass surveillance, right? The police put out an all-points bulletin for Charlie Chan. So they send out to all these devices their model for recognizing Charlie Chan, and bingo, they've got him because they've got all those devices out there looking for Charlie Chan. So I, th I think in this case, uh, um, I think the beauty of any ML, it's better operated, can be deployed anywhere, and it's it's always on. Right? At the same time, it may not have enough uh, horsepower to be able to detect a person a kilometer away or a mile away because. Yeah. It, and I'm yeah. guessing what and you would this, also say is that until you have a standard developed, that's really not going to be a question about the tiny ML community. It is going to be involved in deploying real commercial solutions right. using tiny ML. Yeah, and we have some real examples that come from, from real people, real cities. We've been talking to CTO offices of many cities here in California, and some use cases they brought uh, related to this. For example, if you deploy this type of devices in a park where people obviously are concerned about privacy, then you can see some suspicious behavior, like if all of a sudden people start to run then something's going on there, right? And then you can send either police there or kind of more powerful cameras there or people dump um, garbage in some places and you want to make sure that this is not happening. Again, I think what makes uh, TinyML cool is you have a combination of privacy because people are sensitive to privacy for a reason and kind of an ability to have this massive deployment and collect this data. But at the same time, again, there are some trade-offs because the horsepower may not be, I mean, the resolution, for example, of cameras may not be enough to, to, to get this high-resolution images from, from far, far. And the limitation on horsepower is because you want to be able to deliver so many different devices, right? You want to have a scale, right? And if you're trying to scale with too high horsepower, then basically it slows it down too much. I mean, from, from this perspective, TinyML is complementary to other solutions. There is TinyML, there is HML, there is the CloudML, and all of this will be kind of working, working together to solve specific problems. Um, looking forward, this constraint of uh, battery capacity and processing power is a very artificial one. So where do you see this trend going? Well, I mean, we if you look at the trend of battery increases it's it's not been like you know sort of the the web scale or like all of these other you yeah, know memory and processing power certain. yeah exactly so that's that's the nice thing is that um, we're able to get more processing and more memory out of the same amount of energy so my point is to summarize is this really a, a short term solution to a short term problem So I think the key constraint is the lack of energy. And we're always going to want to go kind of smaller and cheaper and lower power um, for these devices. So I foresee for the rest of my career, at least, like knock on wood, there's going to be, um, there's going to be this kind of frontier of things getting smaller and cheaper, you know, down to like dust moat sized, you know, things that can be scattered anywhere that can actually do significant amounts of sensor processing. Um, so I really see the kind of things where that are sort of millimeters by millimeters at the moment as being actually quite large and kind of only the first wave of being able to get this kind of ubiquitous ambient computing in all of our material things. So I think that there's going to continue to be a need for um, going smaller and going cheaper. I think for me, just to follow on, I think um, the key metrics here is useful information per energy. Right? I mean, today we, 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 uh, we can get as much useful information because we're energy limited in many cases. So as, as we're becoming more and more hungry for more information, you really need to get this kind of down to the, to the data level. And that's, that's, that's what TinyML offers to do. Go ahead. Yeah, so 
all of this discussion has been around low power inference. Has there been any subgroup around adaptation or, or learning at the edge at the device? Yeah, there are some discussions there, I think. I'm not sure if there is a formal group there. Uh, you aware of any piece? Uh, there's, not, there's not really any okay. formal group. There has been a lot of discussion, especially things like anomaly detection. If you want to be able to like slap a sensor on the side of a machine um, and not have to do a bunch of setup, you sort of need the sensor to figure out what's normal. Um, you know, maybe the first hour of operation, it takes and decides, okay, this is normal. And then anything that's a significant deviation from that, it kind of, you know, sends a radio distress signal. Um, but that doesn't necessarily require full learning. Yeah, as I said, adaptation. Or exactly. So there's this really interesting spectrum all the way from just kind of, you know, some very sort of simple kind of tweaking of the results depending on circumstances all the way through to kind of full back propagation and... Yeah. Retraining. Yeah. Would it be to address that? Would it be too much to say that basically what you're doing is you're using the physical constraints of energy and uh, latency as limits that would help preserve privacy, and that you're creating a community at this stage when those physical limits really do constrain how much information you can send out in order to solve the later problems that will occur as you have more ability to deal with you know, energy you know, and more, more advanced technologies. You're creating the community now to solve the ML, the tiny ML, using tiny ML to solve these privacy problems. And or to not, have a route forward to solving the, the problem. You don't have the data to do the training anywhere else anyway, right? It, yeah. It, it's only in the device to train. Well, you, you can Go also ahead. train on metadata. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Okay. You first. Um, given the, uh, the use of TensorFlow Lite and um, a lot of the applications that you um, showed, is the major assumption that in the tiny ML space that neural networks are the the biggest uh, algorithm you can use or are potentially tinier things like um, rainforests? Or so that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and there are so, or some existing um, libraries like Microsoft's ELL, um, like SenseML is using a lot more traditional um, techniques. What has been really interesting has been like the speech team and like a lot of the other product teams that we've worked with who've gone through a lot of evaluations of different approaches, most of them have ended up using kind of the, you know, the deep learning style uh, neural networks as kind of their, um, their standard tool. Um, now, I'm not going to say that there, you know, there isn't, you know, I'm sure there's space for like, you know, random forests and all of this sort of stuff, there's so many problems to solve. But right now there just seems to be this very rich vein in kind of just applying a standard template to a lot of different problems. And it also simplifies a lot of the um, like integration work and things like that. So I, I'm definitely a fan of all those other approaches. But right now we're getting big payoffs from just kind of. And just to illustrate this point, you may know uh, a few years ago, DARPA had a challenge. They call it uh, N0 program. So what they wanted to do is can you develop a system that can do sound recognition, like, for example, glass breakage versus truck type of thing at uh, nanowatts of power. And they put together a team, uh, smart university people around, and they've been able, if I remember the number, a couple hundred uh, nanowatts. And what they use, they use a, a random forest type of classifier in, in the hardware. And the point there is it depends really what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, it's, it's a system driven thing. If, if you want to do a very low energy glass breakage type of detector or truck detector, you, you, you can just train it specifically for the thing and, and the classical models work, work, work nice. If you want to do something flexible to be able to de detect classes of objects, then probably CNNs are more powerful, but they require more on the memory side, on the processor side. So that kind of becomes a system trade-off. And, and what is good enough? I think we, there was a question earlier, what is, what is good enough? 
because for some of these systems, the accuracy can be 90%, and this is perfect, because you can put three or four of these type of devices, and uh, due to the redundancy type of things, you, you can really bring up your accuracy quite high. It may be just good enough. So it's, it's really, I mean, for tiny email, the system approach is, is really important for the, for, from the application perspective. And the radios, like what kind of radius you use, what is duty cycle, I mean, that's also all important questions. But I do believe that there is, like pizza, there is a, coexist a coexistence of this, uh, more modern approaches, neural-based type of approaches, and I think the, the, the more traditional classifiers uh, will, 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 will have applications for quite okay. a while. Yeah. One more question, back in the back. between the robustness and the size of the model, I tend to think that the um, simpler the model, the easier it is to attack. Um, I have in mind the example of uh, auto an autonomous car that, uh, where that is seeing a, pal um, an, a sign, and uh, if you change so slightly the image it is seeing, it could misclassify this sign. Imagine a stop signal, you, you put a sticker on it, and then suddenly it sees a... Uh, um, uh, a speed limit that would be charitable in, in that case. So I wonder if you have a smaller model, does it does it has an impact on the robustness? And like one of my favorite examples of this was I mentioned the yes no detector. Um, I had that at a um, at a show a few months ago, and a, a couple of um, students came over and they spent like half an hour like playing with it, and they finally discovered that. If instead of saying yes, you hissed at it, it would recognize. It would think that you were saying yes because it was. It was Called hearing the S and the hiss. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so they were they were very excited, and you know, and that's a great example. Um, but really, that could that, be also a data set question, right? How you train your model? It, it it is, but it's also a a whole system design question of you don't want to have kind of these single points of failure um, around uh, these sort of, uh, you know, you need to design a whole system that's actually going to be robust because even without um, deliberate malicious attacks, you're going to get, you know, incorrect predictions and mistakes and, you know, just like you do kind of with humans. And if you design a system so that you can have one thing like that that has really bad consequences with no like checks and balances, then you've designed a really bad system. So that's I think I think I feel like there's a whole field around that should emerge around building systems to deal with kind of unreliable um, inputs and s still being able to make the whole system actually have a level of robustness that you need. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I, I think you're exactly right. There's a, you know, especially these small models, they aren't hard to fool. So we need to really think about how we, how we work around that. Okay, I think that we've run out of time, but we've got some refreshments outside. We can continue our discussions in a more informal context. There are no bad questions. Thanks, everybody, and thanks so much for your presentation today.